Hello everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan with two very special guests today. And today we are gonna learn how to turn a whiskey barrel into your very own bar. So I don't know if you've seen any of these things rolling around. They're actually on wheels, dadjokes.com. And they're pretty freaking awesome. Um, I've had a barrel at my house for years. And I mean, I use it as a table, but wouldn't it be awesome if you could open it up? If I could open it up and put some storage in there, right? Um, and so you actually build these, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, take a barrel from scratch and turn it into this beautiful piece of art. At least I try to, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I've seen some footage of you doing it and it's pretty impressive. Uh, but on Bourbon Real Talk, we drink a little bit. And so I have poured for you uh, the Kentucky Owl Batch 1. Have you ever had this before? I have not. Well, this is one of my favorite rye. Why um, is that? I just really was impressed with the flavor. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, when it came out, a lot of people kind of poo-pooed it because it was really expensive and they bought the juice from somebody else and who knows where it's from. Um, but, um, you know, I, I really liked it. And so I just kept buying bottles. Um, I think I had a total of six of these. And then when they released the second release, they lowered the proof a little bit and raised the price quite a bit. And I bought one of those. Um, so this is- So batch one is the one Batch one is the one for me. And I've picked it several times in a blind. Uh, but um, India, I have uh, selected a bottle for you based on your taste preferences. You said that you'd had a Cabernet finished whiskey that you liked. Yeah, this is delicious. Yeah, and so this is a single barrel that uh, someone say whiskey, the club that I help admin um, selected. And both of you are members of someone say whiskey, correct? We are. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, about a year now. Okay. Um, and so, um, Allison, your full-time job is not making barrels. Though. No, I wish that could be my full-time job, but no, I am a high school band director. So I teach the lovely children's. And I would have to tell all of you out there, if you knew any band directors, she has the commanding presence that comes along with being a band director. Um, Thank you. It's, it, I could That's totally, <laughs> I could, I could totally see you like whipping those kids in the line. Literally, like into lines. Well, you know, linear forms are very vital very to marching vital. band, so we do, we do a lot of that. All right, so structure is part of what it takes to make one of these barrels. Very much. Right? Um, and so tell me, what are, what's the first thing that you do when you get one of these barrels and you're going to convert it into a, a, do you call it a bar cart? I just called it a barrel cabinet. Barrel cabinet. It so, worked for me. So when you're going to convert it into a barrel cabinet, what's the first thing you do? Uh, really, kind of depends on the you know the status of the of the barrel. I mean, how did it have wine in it? Did it have whiskey? Did it have beer? I mean, so many barrels get used after the whiskey industry. So kind of my first step is what was in it, and then do I need to neutralize anything to kill any bacteria? So I'll do a solution in and keep it about 24 hours. On uh, one side of baking soda and water, lukewarm water, and then I'll flip it the next day and reset it. So just, we don't want smells right, that are sure. not enjoyable. I just got a box of baking soda and poured about half the box in the in the barrel and then filled it with lukewarm water up until the bunghole so mm -hmm. that, you know, the bunghole is going to drain full out. full exposure. Of, yeah. And yeah. then just leave it open. Uh, that way, you know, it, it can seep into that wood. The wood's going to absorb that moisture and let it sit for 24 hours in my garage. And then the next day I dump that out, I flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. So you get both sides, top and bottom, equally uh, cleansed. Gotcha. And does that help? Because I've seen barrels, in fact, my barrel, the hoops are, are like pretty loose. Does it help like swell it up or does that matter at all? I mean, it'll swell up, but just like anything, you know, it's wood and it's going to expand and contract based on uh, atmospheric pressure and humidity, temperature, all those things. So it's going to, it will expand and then it's going to shrink back down. Um, so after I do the cleansing solution, then I clean up my hoops. If it's, you know, like a wine barrel. And do you take them off to do that? 
You can, I don't, okay. just because uh, once you take them off, it's not always easy to put them back on. Yeah. And it's a lot of hammering. So what do you do to clean them? Um, so it depends. If you have like a wine barrel where it's the galvanized steel, super shiny, then you don't want to use a sandpaper that's going to just create scratch marks over it. Right. Um, so use a nice like fine steel wool on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and any alcohol, like rubbing alcohol just to get off stickers if the if it had a sticker on it. Mm -hmm. um, for the this barrel in particular, it had a lot of rust on it. And mm -hmm. so I was gonna use just a chisel and I just chiseled around the entire thing, basically ripping off lightly any rust, clean that up. Then I took a 300 grit and a 400 grit sandpaper and just rolled that around. And so- Do you use like a orbital sander or no, do you I do it by did, hand? I just did that hand sanding. Okay. Uh, Is there a risk in using a mechanical sander? Or? No, there's not a risk so much. I just didn't want to mar any of it. Because mm -hmm. um, even once you use that that sandpaper, it's still got a grit to it. It's gonna leave the scratch marks. The nice thing about the, the rusted true whiskey hoops, they're not galvanized, they're gonna show those imperfections already, so mm -hmm. less of a concern versus right, yeah. the, the galvanized. Um, so after I cleaned up the, the hoops, then I'm gonna secure a, all of the, the staves and the hoops together with self-tapping screws. Gotcha, and so you're using like a, like a sheet metal screw almost. Basically, uh, you know, I'm, I chose these, they're hex, hex tops, and I just used my impact drill and drove them in, laid the barrel on the side and just rotated. So do you have to put a screw in every stave? So learn this the hard way. I did not do that originally. Okay. And you know, on the, the back where I don't have the door, it's not a big deal because enough pressure, those, those staves are gonna hold each other together. Right. Um, because of the shape of them. But on the door, you need to have one on every, every piece stave. or else you're gonna start, your, your, your wood's gonna fall out. Yeah. So, pro tip. Pro tip. Pro tip. <laughs> Screw everything. I wanted uniformity, at least in the in the screws. So I didn't put one in every one on this, mm. uh, particularly. So, kind so of you evenly space like. them? For the most part, I evenly yeah. try to space them out so that it visually had that symmetry. I know we're, we're big in symmetry in the Indian thing. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, yeah, super yeah, into symmetry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I guess we gotta tell the story. <laughs> I have butt tattoos, people. I got a tattoo on my boat when I was 17. We did not see them, okay. I didn't okay. show anyone, but I, I, did, I did get a butt tattoo when I was 17. And about a year later, I felt all off balance. I felt like I was walking in circles. You know, I needed symmetry. And so I got the opposite tattoo on the other side. And I don't care how much y'all ask, unless you're my friend, I will never tell you what the tattoos are of. Anyways. Cheers to that. Cheers to that, mm. cheers. cheers, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So symmetry. So <laughs> after you've cleaned up the hoops mm -hmm. and you screw in your self-tapping screws, mm -hmm. um, what's the next step after that? Because I don't you do some work on the wood to clean the wood up? I did. You know, that wood's really dirty. It's been sitting in a rick house. It's been sitting maybe in a warehouse. Might have been leaked on by another barrel. Who knows? It's pretty nasty. It's pretty gross. So yeah, then I take a uh, orbital sander, but I use a belt sander. Mm -hmm. uh, start with 150 grit sandpaper. And I just work my way up to 400 and just mm -hmm. put it on the ground, bleed a lot, sweat a lot onto this and cry a little bit onto that barrel as mm -hmm. I go through this process yeah. and just take away layer after layer until I get just a beautiful, clean, basically new canvas. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but I used to build furniture. Okay, yeah. Are you sanding across the grain or with the grain while you're doing this? Always sand with the grain. Okay. Um, and also be careful if you are using a belt sander, you know, you don't want to put too much pressure. If you're familiar with belt sanders, you don't to put too much pressure on it or else you'll start grooving out and gouging out that wood. Right. And so just that consistent, even motion, um, belt sanders, you know, yay big, you're gonna get multiple staves at one time, but it also is circular. Mm. So you have to be careful to not ruin the circular shape of the barrel. Right, you don't wanna you stay in it. one spot for too long. No, yeah. no, definitely not. It's definitely easier if you do remove the hoops, and we refer to that, I, I tried that, and it was a lot easier to sand once I removed the inner four hoops. Mm -hmm. It was just a lot harder to put them on afterwards. Yes. <laughs> so, not gonna do that again. Is there a technique where you like take some of the hoops off and sand? There is a and technique. And then you put the hoops back on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you use a, like a, a punch basically and come up from underneath and just go around and working it. I think I sweated a lot doing that one. Okay. That took until about midnight. I think I started at like one in the afternoon. Oh, and it took multiple people. Yeah, that too, yeah. So we won't do that again. Okay.
So the, the, the winning technique is to leave the hoops on while you're sanding? At least on that particular barrel that I worked on, that was my determination. Um, because once I took off the top hoops, or the, the, the one that really keeps the, the shape of the, the barrel, it took everything else out of proportion. So learning, pro tip, don't take all the hoops on. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, it can, it can be done. It just was, it was a pain. And after I had already put that solution in, you know, that wood expanded. Mm -hmm. So it was harder to put those, uh, the, the hoops back on because now the wood was whiter. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry, Bourbon Real Talk listener. Randy Sullivan coming in for a quick shameless merch plug. If you want to support this channel, you can do so. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. We do not have a Patreon like some of my counterparts. No disrespect, but I don't like to ask you guys directly for money. And I also don't allow any sponsors of the show because I want to be independent to share my opinion with you without anybody putting any pressure on me. So if you would like to get some merch, here's some of the things we have to offer. We have Bourbon Real Talk lanyards. So if you check this out, if you've ever been to a bottle share before, you need to communicate with people, shake hands, do whatever, pick up another bottle, get another pour, this thing is clutch. Secondly, we have the Bourbon Real Talk official Glen glass. This is a tulip shaped glass that's going to help you nose and really enjoy the characteristics of your whiskey. Next up, we have the Wee tasting glass. So this is roughly half the size of a full size glass. This is something very special because on the market, there were only two sizes of this glass and we created a third because my wife, Lindsay, check out episode 100 is an amazing person who can source things and make things come out of nowhere. If you ever go to a tasting and you want to be able to sample a lot of things, but you don't want to drink too much whiskey, you need one of these smaller glasses. Now, a lot of people think candles are just for women, but that's not true. Men like good smells too. And we've produced a line of masculine smelling candles for anybody out there that's interested in that. We've got leather and charcoal and tonka for you guys. Now, as you get more involved in the whiskey collecting game, you're gonna make friends and you guys are gonna trade samples and you need a beautiful solid wood storage case to keep them in because otherwise they're just gonna clutter up your shelves. We have two sizes, one for one ounce sample bottles and one for two ounce sample bottles. But if you really wanna step your whiskey game up, what you need is an American Whiskey Aroma Kit Bourbon Real Talk official. This has 36 separate scents inside of it that are going to help you develop your whiskey palette. You can sit down with a dram, break it down to its components, take your whiskey review level to the next step. This kit is used at two major Kentucky distilleries I can't disclose, but one of them has confirmed that they use this to train their sensory team. So if you want to take your whiskey game to the next level, you need to pick up one of these American Whiskey Aroma Kits. But if you didn't see anything that you liked here, that's fine. It's okay. We're just glad to educate you. We love to have you as a listener. And so at this point, we have a barrel that has, um, the hoops are cleaned up. Mm -hmm. The wood's been sanded. Is And what's, what, what comes after that? So my next step is I'm going to stain it whatever color I want. I use dark walnut on this one. I mm -hmm. find that a very rich color. It goes with the decor of my home. I'm um, sorry, our home. And so I stained everything, you know, got it to the color I wanted it, and then I took it and put a, a sealer on it, poly, uh, polyurethane sealer, all the way around, did two coats of that, uh, and from that point, then I was ready to figure out doing the door. But mm. wait, time out. Time out. At one barrel, we did do a lot of sanding on the inside of the barrel as well. As well. well, that's after you open it, yes. Gotcha. Um, which I feel yeah. like you did not mention that stuff, and I'm only bringing it up because I was doing. It. <laughs> <laughs> I took that out. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so you, you, you've got it stained. Mm -hmm. um, do you do any clear coat at this point, or, or, yes, or do you do that at the end? Mm -hmm. I do okay. the polycrylic at that point around all the exterior. So now you have a cleaned up barrel. Mm -hmm. It's stained. It's got the clear coat on it but you've done nothing to turn it into a cabinet yet. Nothing yet. Right now you just made it a pretty barrel. Pretty much, it, you can sit in a corner and it'll look nice, it'll but look nice. it's no storage. Gotcha, yeah. okay. And so is this the point where we have to add access to the interior? Yeah. Okay, and so what's the first step to creating the door? So the first step to creating the door is use your staves where they are. Figure out how wide do you want this door to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then you need an angle grinder, you need something to cut through those hoops. Mm -hmm. For me, I marked everything with tape, 
pulled it out. I used my jigsaw to make a plunge cut so that I cut along the staves at the top of the second, uh, second from the, the outside hoops. Go across so that it was as close to those hoops as I could humanly possibly get it, sand the heck out of it once it's open. And then along the hoops, I took an angle grinder and then cut that metal mm -hmm. and filed it so it's smooth, not gonna snag anybody, cut anyone's knee. And um, then I had my opening. Now I had my access to the ins entire, inside of the barrel. Gotcha, and, but, and prior to this, you've put uh, self-tapping screws in every stave, every single stave so on, the, on the stave hoop mm -hmm. or on the barrel hoop before you cut yes. it with the anvil grinder. Because if you don't. It, the staves fall out. Yep. Yeah. And then you have to put in some braces afterwards, try to hold it together. It's just really not a good experience. So gotcha. put your staves, pro tip, on everything. On everything. And you don't have to worry about that part. Yeah. The other thing, um, you know, first time, a couple times going through this process and learning better ways before I, or as I was making those angle grinder cuts, I'd have my, uh, my wonderful gate straps to create the hinge on the door. So after I cut one, I'd go ahead and put a hinge strap on. And okay. then I'd cut my other hoop put my neck strap on, go to the other side that was my, my handle side, then cut those hoops. That way, once I cut everything, it didn't just all fall inside mm. the barrel. Then I have to go try to, you know, search it out. out. Yeah. yeah, it's not always fun. And gotcha. it's very dirty inside. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. All right, so at this point, we've got, um, you said hinge straps. So. Yeah, the gate straps. Um, just use what you'll find on a fence in the fencing section at your big box store. Okay. So it's just a hinge? Yeah, it's just a hinge. All right, so you screw the hinges in as you, you cut, put on a hinge. That's what I did. And cut, I, put yeah, on a hinge. And put them on your innermost hoops because of the, the shape of the barrel. That way you have proper opening right. and it doesn't bind. Right. And so then you, um, you now you have a door mm -hmm. that you can open up. Mm -hmm. And you look in the inside of the barrel, what should people expect to see? A lot of black. <laughs> okay. A lot of dirt. A lot of um, grime. It smells. It smells. It's, yes, it's beautiful, and that's why my wife cleaned it one day for me. Nice. Yeah, she's so sweet. I like you. It was great. Mm. I love whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, true wood's not going to have that black chart. I mean, it's charred. Right. It's been burned. It's been burned. Literally. I mean. And then it had. With a rocket, like yeah. they burn it with a rocket. Ah, stuff basically. sitting in it for yeah. a while. Uh, so then we took a wire cut brush and just went to town and just trying to brush off and kick off all of that layers upon layers of burning. Uh, and then I took uh, my belt sander again or orbital sander, a little smaller pad, just to take off more, smooth the inside, make it ready to accept. If you want to seal it or stain it inside, you can. I didn't, just because mm -hmm. I wasn't real willing to do that step. Mm -hmm. And but I liked can. the smell. You yeah, can. I sure. like the smell, though. Yeah. So, yeah, kind of did that. And then you're ready to have fun and actually make it into a... Cabinet. Actual cabinet. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're standing inside. You've got your hinges on. I noticed that the barrel that we're looking at here has a reinforcement on the inside. Yes. That's not necessary if you use all of the self-tapping screws. Is that what you're saying? I found that one, using all the self-tapping screws definitely helps this. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I found when I put this one on is over time, I worked on this kind of, well, I, mean, I, I work a really big full-time job, mm -hmm. so I couldn't finish this quickly. So it would sit in my garage uh, over winter and then it got hot and then it got cold, so it fluctuated a lot. So I put that reinforcement just so I could get the shape of that lid to stay mm -hmm. the way I wanted it to. So how do you make an arched piece of metal like Ooh, that? Ooh, that was, that was fun. Fun. <laughs> um, a hacksaw. Okay. And a vise. A vise. And okay. then my guns. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sun's out, guns out. Sun's out, guns out. And you yeah. just really went to town. Went I went to, to town, town bending that thing by hand. Okay. And trying to get And so the you, shape. you've got you've got the 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 barrel door there mm -hmm. and you've got a vise and you're clamping down and you bend and then you move it down and you bend yeah, yeah. and you move it down and bend and then you hold it up and you go, no, gotta I bend feel like more there. I you've done this before. No, no, I, I like I do <laughs> stuff like this. Like oh, yeah. I can show you some cuts that I've made around here. I mean, I built the whiskey wall, although th none of this was that complicated. But I, when I when earth. I saw yes. that, I thought I would not want to make that arch. Um, but you can do it without that. You just got to kind of pre pre plan. Yeah, pre plan, and then you know you gotta have the right tools. Yeah. And so I worked with what I had, mm -hmm. which was that. It was yeah. And it worked. I got it done. Um, yeah. Mm. And then I spray painted it to 
so it wouldn't corrode and I mean, it looks rust cool. Yeah, it, it does look, look cool. Yeah. It looks, it works. All it's right. Sufficient. So, so now we've got a barrel that's cleaned up on the inside. It's finished on the outside. It's got a door, door's reinforced. Um, you can clear coat the inside or put some sort mm -hmm. of a sealer on it if you want to. Um, you chose not to. I chose not to, yeah. Then what else do we do to the inside? So after it's all cleaned out, you know, vacuumed, I one of the things that I really wanted in my cabinet, and this one was for me, it was a personal project, I wanted to be able to store my most valuable bottles. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, what's gonna make this look cool? I looked up YouTube, I checked out Pinterest and all those different things. And so many people just use prefabricated pine rounds that you get at Home Depot, Lowe's or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it worked, it was a shelf, but it wasn't the full diameter of mm -hmm. the barrel. It wasn't customized. They'd have to get these ugly L brackets that you could see. I just didn't like the way it looked. So I said, I want glass shelving. I know there's a hit or miss opinion on glass shelving. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I don't overweight it, but um, I wanted glass shelving. I wanted lights on the interior and I wanted a lazy Susan in the bottom. Which is crucial in tight crucial. spaces. And I mean, my bottles are in the back. Right, like, you gotta, you know, be able gotta to... get to it. Yeah. So rotate that thing, you get what you want in the back. You mm -hmm. can have a cool display and it's a really cool talking piece. So I mean, many jokes. We talked so about, many jokes. I think you need Sabrina in there. So yeah, I mean, yeah. anyways. <laughs> All right. You just spin around. Just do what you want in the back. Anyway. Uh, okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah, we, went there. <laughs> we went there. All right. All right. So. Hmm. So, Lazy Susan. So, Lazy Susan. Yeah. So, for the Lazy Susan piece, that was my next step. I took a another barrel head that I basically, I planed that thing out, glued everything together because, you know, it's tongue and groove. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with the way these are put together. So, plane everything out. They're not always the same thickness. It's really fun. Uh, Glued that together, clamped it together, made it, got a Lazy Susan hardware, got one of those rounds I referred to from a big box store. Mm -hmm. Did the same process, sanded it down, stained it, sealed it so it matched the rest of the barrel. And then you gotta go to the inside or the bottom of the actual barrel because that inside's not gonna be flat and level. So gotta figure out how that Lazy Susan's gonna sit in there. Mm -hmm. So you don't want your favorite bottles sitting cattywampus. Right, yeah. Yeah. And then you spin it and it's yeah. 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 yeah, got it, so yeah. Can't have a wampus? Hey, I'm from the South, don't, don't judge me. All right. Okay, okay, first off, I'm from Texas and I know exactly what she meant. Okay. I'm also but a bit of, bit of, I got a bit Texas a tattoo, so I mean hype man here, so I'm jumping on board. <laughs> so I had a question because I, I, I saw some footage of you building one of these. Have you ever thought about using like a self-leveling something in the bottom to create a perfectly fat sur flat surface based on gravity? And then, you know, it'd have to be something that you could screw through. True. True. But I, I wondered whether or not you could do like some sort of a self-leveling epoxy and, and then you'd have a perfectly flat surface. I like this idea. Okay. okay all right. So we're going to get together. We just got to seal that bottom because, you know, all those stays are still tongue and groove. So you right. don't want it to fall through. It. Well, um, yeah. Or if some of it came through, it'd be okay. Yeah, you know, it's it not going to be the down. end of the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, all right. So you got to do something to level the bottom, yeah. right? You got to do something to figure out where to put the lazy susan because if you have it not perfectly in the center it's gonna rub and bind it's yes. gonna so, uh, 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 so, uh, yeah. and that's not gonna work i did a lot of uh using that belt sander mm -hmm. and just clamping to a table and just taking away layer after layer after layer after mm -hmm. layer until i got it to where wherever i put it down even if i got it close to center you know it's not perfectly round oh gotcha. no barrel is so i'd get it as close as i could possibly right. so that as you turn it around it's not going to rub so there's a trial and error here oh, where you're you're putting it in and spinning and you're like ah oh, i gotta take a piece off here yeah. Yeah. it's like painting you know you're coming up the ladder going down the ladder up the ladder it, yeah. it felt like a lot like that mm -hmm. so, okay mm -hmm. all right so at some point you figure out where to mount your hardware mm -hmm. everything's nice and flat you've tested your top mm -hmm. and you install it on top of one of these standard rounds, right? Because yeah. the top that you made was out of a barrel head, right? Yes. Okay. And now what's next? Um, by the way, always use three in one oil on those lazy Susan rounds. So they make a little bit less noise. Mm, good call. Not so much fun when you hear that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the next part really was figure out the placement. I took uh, measurements for my glass. I had my glass guy make me a glass shelf for the interior based on the diameter. So I took off about a half of an inch off the overall interior diameter for my shelf so I had some clearance space. Mm -hmm. And then because the top was not perfectly flat and I didn't 
I wanted it to be usable space, I added a glass top to the top. Gotcha. And so I made that about a three quarters of an inch overhang to an inch. Now again, these are handmade, man-made. They're not going to be perfectly symmetrical. They're not going to be perfectly round. Right. And so allowing that little bit of clearance there for, you know, optics to mm -hmm. where it looks at least pretty close. Yeah. Um, used some small L brackets, figured out how high I wanted my, my shelf on the interior. I used a E.H. Taylor bottle because that was my tallest bottle at the time. And I'm designing a, uh, a, a carrying bag to carry bottles and I used... Well, I used uh, unallocated, but it's okay. it's the same bottle. Uh, <laughs> uh, H. Taylor is a commercially available bottle. It's not a custom shape. Mm -hmm. So lots of companies use that, including uh, Kentucky Owl. Yeah. Kentucky Owl is an H. Taylor bottle as well. But it is a very tall bottle. So if you're building things, uh, measure one of these guys, mm -hmm. H. Taylor, um, uh, the musician from Still Austin, unallocated, mm -hmm. Kentucky Owl. There's a lot of companies that use this. It's one of the tallest bottles. So if it'll fit this, it should fit most other yeah. things. Yeah. And so, yeah, I based that on the tallest bottle I had, got the height of the shelf, used my lovely wife to hold things up while I just started making my marks, use my level, make sure that was for sure level. Right, because that's going to hold the glass. That's going to hold the glass, and you don't want that to look bad. But I also noticed you have three contact points. Actually, four. Oh. Um, okay. Well, I'd recommend three because then if you're not perfectly level, it doesn't matter. But if you put the fourth, you you gotta be accurate. you gotta be you gotta be flawless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist, so it worked for us. As a person yeah. who's who's built furniture, I can tell you three legs is a whole lot easier to balance than four. four. Mm -hmm. So um, three legs is always perfect. And so now you've got the glass installed. At this point, we're just installing lights. Just did the lights. Got some LED strips you can get on Amazon. Go to your hardware store. Amazon was cheapest for me. Mm -hmm. Worked. I hooked it up to a timer that you know one of the smart timers works with our uh, Amazon Alexa. And yeah, it lights up our, our front room and all of my collection. Are you telling me that you set your barrel cabinet up so that you can talk to it oh, with I your wake cell phone? Up, I wake up to my barrel. I come in and get my tea and there's my barrel. Oh. And just oh, all it's, it's beautiful. It's a whole thing. I mean, I, I drink tea staring at this in the morning. I, I, I understand. She gets I, a little jealous. I, I, I wake up every morning before my family and come sit in here and work just, this is your... with just the, the whiskey lights on. No, nothing else. It's, it's still same. dark when I get up. So, yes, yes, yeah. Same. So, so that is how you make a barrel. Um, but that is not the most interesting thing about you guys. Um, we actually met because you have a podcast. Yeah. And um, I was giggling with Allison how we came down this long road. <laughs> sure. I mean, we're talking about the barrel today, but really I contacted um, you on a whim on Facebook. I didn't really think you would respond because um, I was, I had opinions and thoughts about an episode that you had in the past and I wanted to, you know, A, connect because I think connecting as other podcasters is good community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also in the Someone Say Whiskey. So I was like, why not? Let's why not? Go. Let's party. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I was, you asked me, what other connections do you have to whiskey? And I was like, well, really, my wife and I seem to have some kind of affair with whiskey. <laughs> we, she also builds barrels. <laughs> yeah. So I thought about having you guys on, but um, since since we're all here, um, what the name of your podcast is? Southern Queries. Southern Queries. Mm -hmm. And it's a podcast about LGBTQ stories in the South. A lot of the stories that Allison and I see on TV, TV, represented in the media um, or just in general everywhere are centered around LGBTQ people in northern cities. Mm -hmm. So whether that's San Francisco, New York, Chicago, sometimes LA gets in there, but really the southern experience of LGBTQ LGBTQ people really doesn't exist. Mm. Um, so my podcast is about that, giving a voice to people in the South who are gay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many stories and so much ris rich history, but I think people consistently think that we're always living in shame, fear, um, or I don't know, repressed because of the society of the South. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really why I started the podcast is I wanted to give voices to people who are not heard. You know, that's amazing. And I know that it's a thing because right after you reached out to me, one of my viewers who um, was a lesbian, she lived up north. Mm -hmm. She was moving to someplace in Texas and I can't remember where it was. 
And she said, I watched your, you know, podcast and I saw that you support LGBTQ and I'm just curious, like, is it, what's it like? Cause I've never lived in the South, but there's a corporate relocation and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I have the podcast for you, right? Like, <laughs> and then I messaged you, I was like, give me the link to your podcast. I got to send it to somebody, you know? So I know that that's for sure a thing. If I came across it, then I, you know, it, it's, it's not like my podcast is focused on that particular subset, right? So if I'm stumbling across it, I know it's a thing. So if you're out there and you want to support LBGTQ or specifically if you have trepidation because you're having to relocate or anything like that, if you want to understand the South's history and the fact that there have always been members of the LGBTQ community here, um, the historical significance of that, um, this is the podcast to go to. Well, and also finding community, which I know you, I, I felt very bonded to you at that moment, but the whole reason why I even started a podcast is because I couldn't find community on my own. Mm -hmm. The DFW Metroplex is huge, and there isn't like a downtown where I can, I mean, there is, but like, it's small and it's hard to find community. Mm -hmm. And I asked Allison, I was like, well, where are the gays? Where are they? I can't see them. Yeah. Um, and we're, you know, hidden everywhere. And I was actually, frankly, super surprised that you had another lesbian or gay person on your show. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many gay women who are into whiskey. And I just loved that there is a spotlight for that and someone say whiskey yeah um and i think it's slowly growing but also women and whiskey almost seems sometimes taboo mm. the fact that we're giving a place and a voice for it that's kind of how i feel about my podcast i'm like i need to give a place and a voice for people who don't feel like they're heard well there's a lot of overlap there and i will say that i i think what happens because i've i've asked my lesbian friends and for the lesbian friends that I have that don't like the word lesbian, my female gay friends, um, I mean, no disrespect to anybody. I've asked them, why do you think that there are so many lesbians that are um, vocal in the whiskey community as compared to straight women? Mm. Right? Because you don't see, like in the whiskey clubs, you don't mm -hmm. see a lot of interaction from straight women. I'm ashamed to admit that my viewership on my whiskey show is 97 to 98% male. Despite the fact that I tell everyone, you're all welcome. Mm -hmm. I want female involvement, all of that stuff. Um, what do they say? What's their answer? Well, I mean, I can't talk to the ones that aren't watching. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, also true. you know, and true. so when I bring that up in front of the the women that I know watch the show, they're like, I love your show. And I'm like, well, you could you tell some other women like I don't. And I, I think what it is, is that there's a, a bit of a, a, um, a, an association of machismo or something or like macho-ness surrounded around whiskey, mm -hmm. that it's a man's drink and it's not. Women have always drank whiskey. Women have better palates than men. Women have had a much long, long, uh, larger impact on the whiskey, the, the development of the whiskey industry than anybody knows. Go read Fred Minnick's book, Whiskey Women. Like, it, it, women have always been involved in whiskey, but they have not always been the vocal ones. And there are a lot of vocal men that make it feel like it's an unwelcoming place. Sure. And I think that lesbians are less likely to be intimidated by that. And so they're more likely to speak up. Is that, do you think that's fair? I think it depends on the person. Uh -huh. I mean, I know some super, very uh, bullheaded straight women. Sure. Who <laughs> have no problem. So I mean, I, mean I, you know, I think there's a degree of personality to it. I'm just saying, but, like, generally yeah. speaking, I feel like if you looked at the percentage of women that are lesbian, yeah, totally. and you looked at the percentage of women that are vocal in the whiskey community, mm -hmm. and what percentage of those are, are gay, totally. that it's the, the percentage of gay vocal women in the whiskey community is much higher than the percentage of 100%. gay women in general. I think we're just used to living in a... a an environment of discomfort to a degree of feeling like, hey, we're like a small percentage. Right. I'm who I am. If you don't like me, get over it. But right. I mean, we're just. So I you're more willing to jump yeah. in the fray. I mean, if you okay. Don't, I mean, well, and I also what's going to do? A lot of your way you move around society, you're constantly having to fight the gender norms. You're constantly having to push those gender norms. Or and just educate. 
yeah, or educate other people, or and you're constantly, you know, pegged for being one thing or another. So when you're in these like more notorious machista or machismo kind of circles, you do get more vocal. Mm-hmm. Um, you give us a little inch, we'll take them on mm-hmm. the giant step. <laughs> Especially this one. Yeah, nice. Uh, yes. I like it. I like it. Well, I love the idea of community. Um, I love the idea of bringing people together. Um, I hope that anybody out there that's interested in that type of content will will tune in. Where can people find your information? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> um, Apple Podcast, um, Spotify, um, Pandora, um, on our website, which is just www.southernqueries.com. Um, dot com on our Facebook page on our Instagram everything is Southern Queries um, and if you're interested in either being on the show or talking about your story you can go email us or send us a DM um, Southern Queries at gmail.com nice well and in the interest of connectedness this may be the first video that you've seen of Bourbon Real Talk this channel is about bringing people together through whiskey and whiskey has a connective power Um, Unfortunately, I did lose my brother to suicide um, in 2014. He was a military service member. And when he came out of the military, he's badly addicted to painkillers. And that led to all sorts of problems in his life. And unfortunately, like so many individuals out there, he, he made that terrible decision to take his own life. And I wanted to find a way to make sure that nobody felt alone. Um, that I could help connect people. And when I started to see how whiskey brings people together and connects people, I just used my love of whiskey and the spirits community in general to create a podcast and to get involved in the whiskey community and someone see whiskey, the club that you're both members of, and in hopes that it would bring people together and help people to know you're not alone, that you're loved, and that you are a part of something that's bigger than yourself and that there are people that care about you. And that is why I sign off every podcast with the same sign off. And that is this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Allison, can you get a little bit closer? Yeah. I don't like you. No, no, bring, bring it on in. I, I, it, let me think of how I'm going to transition. I'm going to have to transition. Um, There's a joke. Yeah, I am. Ashley in India. No. No? No. 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 Allison. 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 Damn it. I'm so bad with names. So close. It's the same sex dominance situation going on. It's like, it's kind of. Intimidating. Yeah. Sounds familiar. What? Yeah. <laughs>